one two breaking ball out toward left field hugging the line this one's got a chance to go go big fly for albert pools number 600 Welcome back to Offstage. We are joined by the play-by-play announcer for the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, Victor Rojas. And Victor, first question I got to ask. How was, uh, and I, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit, but I was just wondering, how was broadcasting in uh, 2020? It was all right. Um, you know, I, I had called games a while back uh, off of monitors. Uh, did mm-hmm. the Caribbean World Series that way down in Venezuela. And, uh, you know, it's not the most uh, efficient way of calling a game. But we had people, meaning fans, even in September yeah, um, on Twitter and stuff like that, basically forgetting that we were, you know, on road games that we weren't there. Yeah. You know, the home games, we were in our booth. And then the road games, we were in a makeshift studio they put out outside by the production trucks outside the ballpark. So you just got to the point where, you know, you just kind of rolled with it and, you know, I think it was harder for more directors than producers mm-hmm. um, because they were li- really limited on cameras on the road. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, was, it was the home feed and you had one extra camera, whereas a normal split feed, like when you do a Fox game at a Fox ballpark or mm-hmm. Sinclair now, um, you know, you, you had not only that feed, but you also had three or four extra cameras that you can cut to different things and follow your story and so on and so forth. So. Yeah. So you kind of have to go off there what they're trying to produce rather than try to produce something yourself, even though you have yeah. the extra yeah. camera. Yeah. Although on this one, all of this, this year they said, or last year, mm-hmm. uh, the home show did more of a world feed. So it tried to stay pretty down the middle and didn't slant toward the home team on a normal season. That's what would happen. And that's where the yeah. visiting team would cut away and do its own thing. Um, so we, so th- I, I think our, they said, our director said that it was harder for them doing a home show. It was harder for them to follow us or do other things on a home show because they had to play it down, down the middle. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause they, they were talking about how this weekend, Tony Romo is going to do it from his house in Dallas for the saints game because he's in COVID protocol. So it's right. just becoming more and more of a, a thing with the, Stay, but I mean, if it's effective and you could do it, I mean, just imagine if John cheap. Madden had it. <laughs> he wouldn't yeah, have to take a bus cheap. everywhere. That, that's that's where I think the uh, the bean counters are sitting there going, "Wait a second, we normally send seven to eight people on the road, hotel rooms, per diems, you know, and the like." And but we could do this from home, and we don't have to pay for any of that stuff. I think maybe we'll look into. I would not be surprised if it becomes more of the norm. Yeah. Well, um, I feel like a lot of stuff is going to become more the norm after this year. Like, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. there are no more paper tickets when people are actually allowed back in. I can't imagine they're going to give those out anymore. It's going to be all which, digital and which is moving towards anyway. To yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. I mean, I'm a fan of it. Hopefully the DH, I like the universal DH. I really do. Me too. I hope it's, I mean, I don't know why we're still playing a, two sets of rules. I think that's yeah. just the dumbest. You no longer have that separation. The offices, you know, American league office, national league office, you know, then I, I get it. You know, you still had that old versus new. Um, but now it's like everyone's under the same umbrella, same rules would make sense. One way or the other, pick one. I don't, you know, National League teams are going to say no because it's an added expense of carrying a DH versus a 25th or 26th man. And what that costs versus, you know, a 10 to 15 to $20 million a year player in a, in a full-time, you know, Ortiz type of DH versus having i don't even know who the you know robbie grossman as your (laughs) you know your bench guy that you're only paying five million to you know what i mean that's yeah that's where that's where the national league is probably more you know really putting their hands or uh, their feet down on saying you know what this is it's not for us but i think major league baseball needs to just go to one set of rules i I think they i really think they do too and the worst part is we're in january now and they still don't know if there's going to be a dh like how is that there there are guys who are sitting yeah. in free agency waiting for this rule to be done yeah uh, you can go all day you know what you can look at it both both ways right you could look at it from the standpoint of well we're still waiting to see cuz if there's going to be 30 teams that I can pitch my services to or 15 teams and the reality is it's not going to be 30 teams not all 30 teams are looking for a dh yeah and if you cut your best deal now 
you know, and I guess the one really that stands out is Nelson Cruz, right? He's, yeah. he's like, he's the guy that's sitting out there that is, you know, been productive, continues to be productive at big time numbers and is going to probably cost you a pretty penny. It probably affects him the most. All the other guys, I mean, it's not like it's a, I, I don't see it being a trickle effect on those guys because those guys should just go out and cut the best deal possible at this time. Just cut a one-year deal if you're worried about it. And you really want to make sure that you're on the on the on the books already for uh, for 21. Just cut a one year deal and, and hit the market again next year. That's what a lot of guys did. What was it two years ago? When um, yeah, I think the big name was Martinez, who ended up getting a longer deal. But I think a ton of those guys were taking one year deals because yeah. But I think uh, Encarnacion's also on the market, but he's been on a little bit. He's not yeah, like Nelson I mean, Cruz at 40. Home. Slide, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, he's he's still absolutely mashing the ball but he's another guy and i think ozuna is another guy that a lot of people talk about just moving straight to dh because he did so good with the braves at dh this year man there's some bad left fielders out there so oh I, yeah <laughs> so you know that, that's why i say if you can you know if you can if you can live with marcelo zuna through seven innings defensively for what you get on the offensive side of things and if he's the guy that fits your lineup is going to make you better yeah i think you just have just i think you it. gotta yeah you have to i yeah. think you do well, isn't it isn't it crazy that it wasn't that long ago that the worst kid played right field? Yeah, <laughs> right, you, got, right. you got the best players in right field. It's unbelievable. Yep. You got the bets yep. of the world in right field. <laughs> yeah, it's it, crazy, man. It's, it's really crazy. Let's roll right along right here. Yeah, it's going great. It's going great. Um, so you started as a player and then you did uh, bullpen catching and coaching. How'd you make the transition from the field to the booth? Well, I mean, I had gone from the field to real life because you know you get to a certain point in your career where you like either mentally aren't there or physically aren't there and or they tell you hey you're done you're 86 <laughs> you're not good enough um uh, for me it was more about i had gotten married um i was an all-star closer my first year got married my wife got pregnant and i really started looking at you know do i want how long am i going to make 800 bucks a month and how can i live on this supporting a family so for, for me, it was the vision down the road, not, not right now. And uh, even though I kept dabbling a little bit, once I got to the point where I was done after 94 coaching and, and you know, kind of player coach in 94, I started looking at like the front office side of things. So that's what I did. I bounced around from front office, front office, arena football, minor league baseball. I worked for the Florida Panthers hockey team. Um, and then I went to the arena management side. I did a bunch of things because with no college degree, I felt like I had to really accelerate things. I had to, I had to play catch up in my mind to gain the experience that I, I never really got. And I was 31 and I just finished consulting and I was working. I took a, a holiday job at Nordstrom Boca Raton, Florida and working in customer service. And I got this wild idea literally 20 years ago last month about, I think I'm going to try my hand at broadcasting. I think, I think I'm going to try to see if I can get back into independent ball as a player. And then in my downtime, go to the radio station and learn the craft. My dad always said, you know, you got a pretty good voice. You know, the game of baseball, you grew up in it, you know, go that route, do interviews and stuff like that. And I learned quickly that nobody really wanted me as a player anymore at 31. And I got lucky that Rick Cerrone, the former Yankee catcher owned the Newark bears. And I had a friend of mine who's his third base coach. He said, forward me your resume. He gave it to Rick, looked it up and down, saw my front office experience and said, hey, why don't you come up here, be my AGM. You put the team together. It's ind independent ball. And you could do, you know, uh, some, some uh, color on the radio broadcast because they already had a play-by-play -play guy. And that's how my broadcasting career started. Before the season started, Dave quit. Our play-by-play -play guy quit. He went to uh, indoor lacrosse. So I became the play-by-play -play guy with no experience. <laughs> and then a month into the season, they, they let go our general manager and I became the general manager. So I was general manager slash broadcaster of an independent league team that had signed, you know, I, I had signed Jamie Navarro and Jack Armstrong. Then Canseco got released out of spring training. He called me because he and my brothers played together in, in, back in the early 80s. But Ozzy, his twin brother, played for us the year mm -hmm. before. He said, I want to come play with Ozzy. So Jose came on board. Jim Lairitz came on board. Lance Johnson came on board. And all of a sudden, we have all these big leaguers in 2001 yeah. in Newark. And that's kind of how it all is snowballed for us. So you, um, I want to skip right to another one because you had the opportunity to interview for the GM job for the Angels this year. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? I know you wrote a, a letter to them or you wrote a suggestion to them asking if you can get an interview. And then you got it. How did that go? And what was that like? 
It, it went well. I, I, I thought, uh, you know, the team had really had been this. This was my last uh, last year was my 11th season with the ball club as their broadcaster. Uh, I had played in their minor league system. My dad had spent 10 years in their organization, including managing them in 88. So I had a really close bond to the Angels organization. Uh, really, it's the Royals who I grew up with in Kansas City and my dad played for. And then it quickly in 82, after he coached for the Cubs, I became an Angel guy. You know what I mean? And so it was just like this perfect storm of circumstances. The team was playing horribly bad. Uh, the pandemic. Um, I, I was tired of seeing and hearing a lot of different things from up and down the organization. And I just got to the point in late, uh, late July or late uh, August, where I just started writing stuff down, just ideas of how I would change things and culture. And I, I, I joked about it being like my Jerry Maguire moment. I, I was going to write the memo and send the memo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, all things be damned. I never sent it, but I ended up you know, almost 4,000 words. And then when Billy Epler got let go, I immediately texted Artie Moreno, whom he's the guy that hired me, you know, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And I just said, you know, I want that effing job. You know, I want the opportunity to talk about the job. And, you know, to his credit, he gave me the opportunity. I sat with you know, John Carpino and Bill Stone and had an interview and um, I had no regrets. I said everything I wanted to say. I kind of laid out what my plan would be from the big league club to player development to international scouting and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, obviously they went in a different direction. They interviewed a ton of people. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad I was part of the process. It was a, it was a great learning process for me. And what, um, could you just give us a little bit about what would be, cause the angels have been in like this weird state where they have such good players, but they just can't get over the hump. So what would no. be your plan to kind of turn them around? Well, I mean, you, you got to go back to uh, to scouting and player development. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I, I can't, uh, you know, I was trying to rack my brain who the last, I mean, Griffin Canning was drafted and developed by the Angels, and he's a local product as well out of mm -hmm. Rancho Santa Margarita, California, in Orange County, and went to UCLA. Uh, but you have to go back to pretty much Jared Weaver. Uh, you know, Matt yeah. Shoemaker was a, he, he wasn't a drafted player, he was an unsigned free agent that came into the organization and rose through and got to the big leagues and still there. Um, but they really had done a poor job of drafting and developing, especially on the pitching side of things. And so, uh, you know, that, that to me, you got, you got to get back to the, the little things really improving um, the facilities, uh, putting money into the scouting side of things. Really the international scouting has been, uh, it's, it hasn't been very good for, for many years. You go back to, um, when Jerry DePoto uh, at the time was the general manager, he, he went off and signed uh, Roberto Baldacchine out of Cuba for $8 million. And the kid was an absolute bust. So that $8 million signing cost the Angels the next couple of years from being able to go out and sign any international players, one of which was Vlad Guerrero Jr., which would make sense. Yeah. As an Angel <laughs> He'd be the guy you want to go invest in. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And so you, you really, the mindset change you have to change the mindset a little bit and uh the culture um, when i got there uh you know bill stoneman had already stepped down tony regans was a general manager so tony regans and jerry depoto to billy epler that's three gms in 11 years mm -hmm. now you think about all the changeover and carryover people that stayed over that's three regimes three different types of philosophies and now you get this mishmash of people wanted to do certain things or we believe in this. And it's like, it's just kind of mayhem. And I think that's where I think I was getting frustrated. I think angel fans were starting to feel that as well. And I, I you know, they, they, I think they hired a great guy in Perry Manassian because I've known Perry since our days together with the Texas Ranger. I've known his dad a long time as well. And he is a guy that is very tempered, uh, gets along with everybody He's got a great smile. His smile lights up the room, and you so you feel at ease. And if he's going to say, this is what our philosophy is, I think he's going to bring in his own people. But I think it's going to be a, a, a buildup, right? It's going to take mm – -hmm. it's not going to be one off season, But you got to continuously get rid of the old. And, and I mean by old, I mean the old personnel that is more – concerned about how is this going to help me versus how are we helping the organization? Yeah. And I think there was way too much of that. Now you got a really splintered player development 
Uh, and I think that's what you need is someone at the top there that can bring it all together and, uh, and kind of go from there. But it all starts with scouting and player development. Yeah. And I mean, look at the Dodgers for Pete's sake. Yeah. I was, to so, lose. Yeah. Justin Turner, who cares? It doesn't matter. They just, they, they're going to have somebody else. Yeah. They've got, they've been able to draft and develop these people, whether it's a position player or a, a, a pitcher. And for the angels, you know, the, the mindset has been on the scouting side of things, the, the high upside guys, right? The, the, the guys that could jump out of a room or jump out of a gym that have all this athleticism that still need a little polish here, a little polish there. And if we get that polish just right, they're superstars, right? Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of things have to go right in order for that to happen, as opposed to taking the sure thing. And the other thing too, from and I, I'm dragging on here, the other thing too Feel that free. needs to change is, and it's not just the angels, a lot of teams do this, is the one size fits all mentality. You cannot have a philosophy and say this philosophy, and I'm going to approach the 300 guys I have in my minor league system from an offensive perspective or from a pitching perspective, they're all going to do this philosophy because it's impossible to get individuals from a mindset, from a, from a physical standpoint, to buy into something that maybe they can't do, don't comprehend, don't understand. There's a language barrier. There's so many variables that go into it. You can't go into it with the mindset of, oh, this is going to be a philosophy and we're going to get everybody to do this. Well, why did you draft that player? You drafted him based on the ability that he brought to the table then. You, he got you excited. Hone those skills. Take those skills to the next level as opposed to trying to change him into something he may never be or may never become. And that's actually a big thing with multiple sports. When you see yeah. guys, and, and let's take another sport, for example, you see a quarterback that plays one way and he goes to a team and they try to change him. It's yep. like, don't try to change him, try to build off of him. Correct. And it's funny because if you look at teams that have been successful in the last couple of years, you know, you talk about the Dodgers, we could talk about the Yankees and the Cubs and teams like this it kind of feels like they do the opposite of what the angels are doing where the angels kind of go out and they try to buy more bats. Like the Rendones of the world are is years ago now, but when they got pool holes or stuff right. like that, other teams, it seems like they try to build those guys from, from the ground up and then go and buy the pitchers. The Cubs are great. Or the Royals are actually a great example from mm -hmm. when they won the world series, when they went to world series, Cubs are a great example of that. You know, they try to build up around the bats around, get these established guys and build up the pitching. Um, but why do you think the angels kind of go in a different way of that? I mean, they have gone out and got more pitching nowadays, but it feels like for right. years, that's what they've done is go buy the bats. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's not all been that way either. There's been circumstances where, you know, Garrett Cole decided to sign with the Yankees. Yeah. Clearly he was the angels. Number one choice last off season, went a different direction. And if you're going to spend money, well, let's, let's add, if we can, Anthony Rendon wants to come he's, to town. Okay. Then. Good. The, the Angels needed a third baseman, and third base has been a black hole for a long time. You know what yeah. I mean? So they've at least addressed that. You know, you bring up the, the Royals, you have to look at the nucleus that they came up with, though, too. You know, you got Hosmer, uh, they made the trade for yeah, Escobar, the Zach the Rinky deal. Yeah, you got yeah. Salvi Perez, you got Alex Gordon. So there's a nucleus there. And then as they grow up together and they're on that peak, then you go out and buy the pitching. I get it. Yeah. Now they flip the script a little bit, right? So a couple of years ago, they had all those first round picks, first and second round picks, comp picks. And what they take, like five or six straight college pitchers. Mm -hmm. Well, now, two, three years later, because they're college picks, and you know, two of them, I think, from University of Florida in the first round. Now they're already they're on the cusp of getting to the big leagues, if not already there. And now they're going out and buying little pieces that they can afford when it fits within their budget. And and they're gonna make a run in in, in the central division. You know. Why is it that, I, you know, I think it just goes to, again, it, it's buying into the philosophy and not getting too far down the road. You have to, I, I guess it all depends on who you believe and who you talk to. Sometimes there's impatience, you know, and you feel like I got to go do something. You know, this isn't working out. We look down in the minor leagues. There's nobody down there that's going to make an impact from a pitching perspective. So let's, we got to go do something. And the Angels have done something. Uh, quite a bit in the last 10 years since mm -hmm. they got off that, you know, great run of constantly being in the playoffs yeah. that, that finally ended after the 09 season. And so I, I think that's the more frustrating part for, for angel fans. So I, I think you gotta, you gotta stick with a plan. I think you got whatever the plan is, if you're buying into it, you gotta let it happen. You gotta let it, you know, maturize. And, and really 
it's hard because not that Mike's on the back end of his career, Trout that is, yeah. but you, you wanted it to run parallel with his career, his trajectory, right? Yep. And now you're kind of getting at that plateau where you're still, you, the pitching's down here trying to catch up and, you know, Mikey's coming around the top. You know what I mean? And, and so now you, now's when you want to speed things up if it's not from a development standpoint to go out and get the best guys available from a pitching perspective. So we'll just have to wait and see because off season's still going on. There's still, you know, there's some pitching out there. Lots to be of had. names. We're talking yeah. about Victor Rojas. Um, that's, that was going to be my next point. I am one of the biggest Mike Trout fans in the world. I absolutely love the guy. He is just an unbelievable player to watch in every aspect of the game. He's good at everything. Yeah. Everything. And first of all, it must've been a privilege. Stupid He's, good, by the yeah. way. His yeah. career is basically lined up with your Angels career almost, right? Yeah. Yeah, almost I beat him. I beat him to the big leagues. Yeah, yeah. I, and I take pride in knowing that I, I made more than Mikey for the first couple of years in the big leagues. <laughs> <laughs> That's neither here nor there. <laughs> it, it's and he's passed me since by quite a bit. <laughs> I, I think that's why the impatience grows within yeah. fans because of, like you said, you wanted to be parallel. You don't want this guy to be getting into his thirties when they finally start getting good. I think he only right. has one playoff appearance, if I'm correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So you don't, you don't want him to be coming on the downswing and now the team's finally getting good. And then you kind of get what Kershaw was in where we need to win now because Kershaw is not going to be around too much longer. Yeah. And I think that's where the impatience is building from. And I, I could, I, I'm not an angels fan, but I can feel it because I like Mike Trout so much. Yeah. I want to see his team be successful with him on it. I think that's why I asked the question about the pitching. Cause that's what it always seems to come back to is I, the, I think this year their number one pitcher stats wise was Dylan Bundy, who had a great year. Yeah, 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 yeah unbelievable year. year. Yeah. But that's not who you'd ex- you know, when you're signing guys like Rendon, you'd think they'd want to you'd bring in guys like that. Now, of course, I don't have nowhere near the knowledge you do with this kind of stuff. Right, right. But yeah, Dylan, Dylan Bundy's like found, Dylan Bundy's like found money, right? You make the yeah. trade because at a necessity, you need a starter. They clearly liked what he brought to the table, and they probably could have lived with a four, four and a half ERA because that's what we do nowadays. We're okay with that as long as they eat some innings and pick up some strikeouts and and, and limit the the run production. But he ended up having a, a an unbelievable, maybe an outlier year. I don't know. You know, if he can carry that over, then then Dylan and Mickey Callaway. Because Mickey's the new pitching coach he yeah. was last year for his first time, who I think is one of the best pitching yeah, coaches. Great in baseball, pitching coach, they, along with Brent Strom rough, in Houston. A little rough as the manager, but as a pitching coach, he's a he's he's a genius, time. and he's a great communicator. You know, and and so, you, what's the value in that? And so, if if you can carry that over, then you at least have somebody that, from Perry's perspective now, can look at the diamonds in the rough. You know, you're still going to go for that that big signing because you need to um, mm-hmm. but look for that diamond in the rough. Cause you know that like Brent Strom did in with Garrett Cole in, uh, in, in Houston uh, you've got Mickey Calloway. They could probably do the same thing, but you, it needs to be complimented. You mentioned Kershaw on the back end. Yeah. But I mean, that baton that he's passing, the yeah, guy behind it's, him, it's, it's Walker Bueller. Bueller. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> I'd like to have that. That'd be nice. You know? Um, and even the kid uh, was it Justin, the redhead kid from from right here down. I live in Texas, so he's right from down the road. From uh, here. May, yeah, J- Justin May. I, I mean, that guy Urias he, was great too. To I watch. Mean, I mean, it's just all of a sudden they got guys that are just there that blow. I mean, they ninety six and up and throw strikes and can get guys out. So it, it makes it a lot easier. I mean, you Dave Roberts is a genius now, right? Uh, from as a manager that uh, he's got. He's got the wherewithal. And it's funny that this year, this year, the way the World Series played out, when you watch Kevin Cash pull Blake Snell, Dave Roberts, Dave Roberts is like, nah, man, I've been down that yeah. road. I'm not playing that game. If <laughs> I'm going to lose, that. I'm going to lose it my way. I'm not playing with it. Hey, I appreciate the information from up above, but if I'm losing, I'm losing my way. And I'm glad he – this this year's team, the Dodgers team, when we yeah. played them the first time, uh, I looked at Mark Gubas at one commercial break. I'm like, these guys are stacked top to bottom. That bullpen was ridiculous. And they were as focused as I've ever seen them. Like laser, like, all right, done with the screwing around. Let's get it done. That's what it felt like. And after a while, you know, you get into September, like most teams do down the you know, midway point, being 60 games, it was around the midway point. Um, where, you know, they, they falter a little bit. The bullpen's going to falter, but boy, they, they turned it around. Um, yeah. You give them an inch, they took a foot and a half, and, you know, the Braves had them. The Braves certainly had them, and, and they let them up. 
Yeah, they had him on the ropes there. Now, going yep. back really quick to the – when Blake Snell was pulled, what were you thinking? Like, uh, What I, the hell is Kevin Cash doing? Yeah, you uh, had to be right there with the right – 75 pitches, fourth inning, made I the mean, three best hitters in the lineup look like – like they didn't know what they were doing. No, it was like they were celebrating in the Dodger dugout that he was gone. And, <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate analytics. I take them for what they are. I think they're a great jumping off point. They're, they're not an absolute. They're just not. Uh, the analytics, until the analytics in general can, uh, can, can change in real time based on circumstances and take into account the human element, they don't work in the middle of a game. Again, they're a great starting point. You could say this is going to be the plan, but your eyes have to tell your eyes and the opposition have to tell you what's going on. You had a, you had a team of the Dodgers that, that, that wanted no part of Blake Snell. He was dominant, dominant. And then on top of that, not only do you take out Blake Snell, you bring in a guy who his previous Struggle. three outings had given up runs. Yeah. And I know he was your guy, but why would you go back to him? So he like compounded the issue. And so, I, you know, Kevin, you know, he said he's going to say the right things, right? Because he's going to protect his bosses. And, 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 and that's where I think the analytics are, are the biggest crutch for managers. Uh, because they could just kind of push off the blame, you know, the numbers say this, or, you know, they can always just go to that as opposed to, I made the decision. This is what I saw. This is what I wanted. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to wear it. Um, you just don't see that too often anymore. I think Joe Madden is probably one of those throwbacks that is willing to say he's willing to call a team out. He's willing to call a guy out, uh, willing to point the finger at himself if he makes a mistake. Um, but I think we got to, I, like I said, I love the analytics side of things to get you prepared, but you gotta, you gotta be able to adjust, man. And guys looking in their freaking hats or back pockets and nowhere. <laughs> I mean, there's no feel for the game anymore. No. None guys don't fundamentally don't know. How do you not know who's coming to the plate? Who's on the mound for you and where you should be positioned. Yeah. You know what I'm you saying? See. It's like, you really need a card to tell you all this stuff uh, because the circumstances today are different than the the history that you have on that card you, you know everything is completely different about what's on the, I, I know it's a pattern and the like but you have to take into account what's happening in the moment and, so, and make the adjustment and they're, they're afraid to do that so are you uh it sounds like you don't really like how the uh the analytics are saying hey go for the home run or just go down go down swinging instead of adjusting yeah i'm not i'm not a big I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I, I think to me, contact percentage has got to go up and uh, line, you know, hard hit. I, I, I'm a big believer in contact percentage, hard hit percentage, uh, barreling baseballs. I think that's more important to me than, than the, the lift and separate. I'm not okay with the strikeouts. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's funny because, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm truly a simpleton. I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I don't have a college education, but I've been around a little bit. I, I you know, I'm kind of street smarts, right? That's how I, I like to play it. And, and just to dumb it straight down, to really water it down, uh, the new school thinking, and I hate that old school, new school, but the new school analytical side of things, thinking is uh, sacrifice bunts, don't ever give up an out. No. Nope. And stealing bases. Although it seemed like this year, and I'm, I'm digressing here, it seemed like last year, there was more attempts at stolen bases. I have to look up the numbers. It just seemed like people were running more. Yeah, it did. I don't know why, but anyway, they don't, they don't like those because of the, the, the chances that you're going to make an out, but you're okay with a guy going up there that has a low contact percentage and striking out on the off chance over the course of 550 at bats or 60 at bats that he hits 30 home runs. So you're okay with that ratio and giving up the out as opposed to, you know, sacrificing somebody or, or stealing a base. That's where I, I, that's where I don't understand. I, and again, I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but I would rather have somebody that's willing to drive the baseball to the alleys. And if you hit a home run, you catch it out in front a little bit and you lift the ball out, then you hit a home run. Yeah. Uh, Mike Trout will tell you today, he's not a home run hitter, but, but damn, if he doesn't, if he does not make more contact out in front of the hitting zone than anybody else in yeah. baseball. And that's why he's launching balls the way he is, you know? Yeah. And it, I'm right there with you. I, it frustrates me so much. I actually think it's one of the big reasons that they always say, you know, baseball's viewership is going down. I compared it to somebody like this. Imagine if the NBA made all rims double rims. 
and it made right. slam dunks happen all the time and they were spectacular but now three points and other shots they're not going to go in as much and scoring is going to go down it's the same right. thing with baseball the home right. run is not as big as it used to be because that happens all the time correct so people correct. aren't like going crazy about them like when juan pierre would hit a home run people would go nuts but yeah. now brett gardner's hitting opposite field home runs at yeah. Stadium. breaking his bad going up oh yeah. yeah it makes no sense so yeah. it's it's the same thing if the, these guys are doing dunks every single time because it was the only way you could score and it was the best way to score yeah. it would just lose everything yeah and it's not, it's not just the offensive side too, right? It's the pitching side. I mean, you got guys that can't throw strikes consistently. Well, uh, yeah. you're, 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 you're three, two on every single count. They feel like they've got to throw everything max effort every from the, from the first inning, first pitch of the game. Um, you know, there's you no, there's no art to it. And I think that's why people are born. It's like, Oh, here we go. You can't name a player that throws under 95 you anymore. You walk or make it out. You know what I mean? It's yeah. That's, that's the biggest problem. There aren't many players that throw under 95 anymore. They just don't get drafted. Right. They, they look for the guys for a hundred. Velo's fine. I know. Yeah, okay, fine. But you got to be able to command the four quadrants of the strike zone. That to yeah. me, pitch ability, uh, being able to command the strike zone. Those are, those are all important. Velo's great, but if you can't throw a strike with it, who cares? Yeah. But I guys, think, every, all these guys can gear up and hit a hundred miles per hour. Yeah. But that, it's the guys that can, can do here it and here and here and here that, are successful because the hitters have no idea and you have the ability to throw a strike at any time with any pitch. Yeah. I think that's being sacrificed though. When they're looking for these guys, they see the no guy question. That hundred and they're like, get this guy. But the guy right. that maybe throws 89 that can build his velo, but they don't right. want to even do that. They, they want the velo there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. maker, 89 split. Yeah, exactly. Non-drafted, no. non-drafted at Eastern nope. Michigan. How much money is he making going to make this year? You know what I, I mean? It's, it's crazy. And I go back to the Yankees, obviously. I mean, Yankee fan. Jordan Montgomery is the same way. He doesn't, he's throwing harder this year, but he didn't, when he first came up, he was 89, but it was that curveball in his location. That was the yep. big, that was the big stuff with him. So I want to switch over really quick. Uh, big fly gear. Now, big fly is your home run call. Big fly for blank. Uh, my favorite one's Albert Pujols because I love Albert Pujols. Um, so how did you come up with the company, the apparel company of big fly? We, uh, my wife and I were trying to figure out what we wanted to do from a, from a business standpoint. We knew we wanted to do something um, kind of that ran parallel to what I was doing on a full-time basis. And so we came up with the idea back in 2018, the fall of 2018, um, to, to create a baseball apparel company. And uh, having just spent that summer in Cooperstown with my son doing the, the old rite of passage at 13 years of age, you know, playing the tournaments up there in the summertime, we went to baseballism. First time I'd ever been to a baseballism store. And I thought this was kind of cool. And I, that's where the idea really started from an apparel standpoint. And I said uh, to my wife, I'm like, but we, it's got to be unique. We, we can't just go in there trying to become a typical licensee or typical stuff that what, what baseballism is doing. It's got to be completely different. So we came up with the concept of a player person and her moment in baseball history and then creating a one of a kind graphic art, as I like to call it, because it is. Um, that tells the story without a player's likeness, without a player's name, without a player's number on most occasion. And, um, but, but encompasses what that story is. And so, you know, the Millville media for us is our Mike Trout. Uh, we've got the Eminem boys, which is the Mantle and Maris. Uh, this year, 60th anniversary of the, of the home run chase in 1961. Um, uh, Let's play two is our Ernie Banks. So, you know, we, we call ourselves storytellers because we are, that's what I do as a full-time job. Um, but we're vintage baseball storytelling. And, you know, we launched it in February of 2019, had a great run in 19. We were off to a great start last year when we launched uh, Millville Meteor in February, going into spring training. And then all of a sudden COVID hit. But still, um, somehow, some way, even with the 17 weeks of sales uh, because of COVID, we've exceeded our revenue from the year before by almost 60%. And, you know, people, were, were, people are buying our, our stuff that you know, we have great repeat business. We get new and new customers, new and newer customers every single day trying us out. And that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to grow it organically. Um, it's not like I need to make money off of this. It's not like, oh, I don't have a job and this is it. We, you know, we need this to survive. It's, it's kind of like an ancillary thing. And we run it out of our house and it's a complete family business. Yeah, I'm going to have to get one. I like the hat. I'm going to have to get one of those hats. Thanks, that's man. A, that's a nice hat. Thank um, you. If, if you were to give advice to anybody that's trying to come up and be a broadcaster, get into the broadcasting business, what would you tell them? Um, be yourself, really, is what I tell a lot of people. Uh, you know, oftentimes, whether it's in college or from, 
you know, a potential agent or someone that works in the business in the industry that, uh, you know, an executive producer or whatever, uh, oftentimes they want you to be a kind of in the cookie cutter mold of, of, you know, whatever broadcaster. I think sometimes you get into that mindset, uh, you know, young broadcasters, well, I, got, I have to sound, or I should sound like whoever, Joe Buck or whoever you name anybody. And so when you hear their, their audio, you, you kind of hear like, and hear what they're trying to do. Um, and so they're trying to become somebody else. So I, I always preach, be the best version of yourself and not the second version of somebody else. And, and really find your voice. It took me a while to get there. I mean, like I said, I had to learn on the run. I had two years in, in Newark and then I got the Diamondbacks job. And then I, then I went to work with Hall of Famer and Eric Nadell with the Rangers. Mm -hmm. And I thought what he was doing was the way I should be doing. And I tried to do it and I couldn't. And it was at that point, like a couple of months in, I'm like, I gotta, just got to do my own thing. And that's, that's kind of where I found my voice and my, my way of doing things. And it really evolved up until maybe three or four years ago, where it's kind of like, now I just put on a pair of headset. I don't, you know, give me a score sheet or not, whatever. I just know, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to let the game come to me. And that's why I've always believed in. I don't, I don't call games off of monitors. You know, I watch the game, what's happening. And I, I like to see the field because it gives me the opportunity to see everything. And that's why the transition to calling games off of monitors in 2020 wasn't that big a deal because we had this high camera, high home camera that showed the entire field, mm -hmm. which is essentially the same perspective that I use on a daily basis when I'm doing games. So yeah, yeah for sure. Don't, don't try to be anybody else. It's great to try to emulate somebody, but find your own voice, find, find your own thing, be unique because the last thing you want as we've seen in, in this pandemic world is you don't want to be the same guy. You want to be the same girl. It doesn't matter what females, males, it doesn't matter. Um, find your own voice and be different so people will know who you are, that you stand out a little bit. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be right back. That was a great way to start the new year. Great way to restart season one. Um, I think we've had a lot of great guests. Obviously, no one's going to rebuttal with me, so I'm right in this situation because nobody can go against me here. But I think it went really well. Two great guests to start. We already have some good guests lined up. I can't tell you who it is for legal reasons, but we have some good people coming on. So definitely stick around. Go uh, to Instagram and follow us off stage radio, off dot stage that radio because of technicalities. Uh, we're on Twitter as well, off stage radio, Facebook, off stage radio, YouTube if you want to watch us. If you're not already watching us, off stage radio. Basically, just look up Offstage Radio and you'll find us. That's how we've become. We've become one thing where you can find us everywhere. You can also go to schnabelproductions.com slash Offstage Radio and you can find all of this stuff. So definitely go check it out. Check out the holiday episode if you haven't. It's really terrible and corny, so that's a lot of fun. Um, we'll see you next week on Offstage Radio. Yeah.